Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Figure It Out cast for December 2022. I am your host, I'm Adam Korlick. How's it going, everybody? Uh, so uh, just before we get started here, as always, this is a Patreon-backed podcast. So you can get early access to this or uh, any of my videos if you subscribe to Patreon. You also just help to support the channel. Uh, that means you can get early access to videos, you can get shout-outs, you can pick subjects, and you can even be on the podcast. And uh, that, that actually happened here. Uh, we've got, uh, it's not Abdullah. Abdullah's out right now. He's got uh, some medical issues. We wish him the best. But uh, we are joined now by Joseph. He's here a little early. What's up, man? Hey, Adam. Things are going pretty good. Good. I'm so. glad. Uh, no Rob this month. He had a scheduling conflict yet again. He has to work like an adult. It sucks. But, um, mm. yeah, it's okay. Uh, so we will... Uh, we're, we're just going to carry on. Are you, are you ready to go? Yep. Okay. So... Uh, our first subject would have been Abdullah's, but again, he's not here and he didn't have one, so okay. Uh, we have a couple of Patreon backers who get to pick subjects. Uh, so this one comes from Chuck Shaw, uh, which I thought this was kind of interesting, actually. So he says, I'm just going to read out exactly what he wrote. Uh, World of Warcraft recently announced that a new feature would be added to their Wrath of the Lich King classic, a re-release of an old World of War expansion. Do you think more classic games should be re-released with new content? Example, Mario 3 with new suits, Shenmue 1 with new story items, and so on. Um, basically, I interpret this question as, like, uh, retro DLC. If you were to reissue games, what games would you potentially want to see with DLC, or do you are you opposed to this concept? What do you think of that? Uh, honestly, this is going to be a bit of a cop-out answer, but it depends. Of course. On the, game, <laughs> on the game in question, honestly. Like, in the case of World of Warcraft, like, with the WoW Classic stuff, I mean, I've never played World of Warcraft, so maybe someone who actually plays the game would have a different thought on that. But I feel like that if you're explicitly, like, on a game that's... If you're basically issuing a classic version of a game that's constantly getting updated and still has a modern version of it, you probably should leave it, leave it how it was, because... Anyone who's playing the classic version of it wants the old game, not a game with new features in it. That see, that's fair. Like I, I can't speak to to WoW specifically because again, it, like you, it's not my game. I, I wasn't a, a big you know expert on it by any means. Um, but you know, he mentioned like Shenmue specifically. Like the idea of a DLC pack for Shenmue for a split second kind of intrigues me. But then I think like no. The game is crafted in such a way where I really wouldn't want an, a new side mission because it clearly couldn't add anything to the narrative, uh, and it couldn't really if extra items likely would be completely superfluous. So I'm not really sure they would do much that I would really appreciate. But I can see where certain games that would be cool. Like for example, um, one of my favorite games from the sixth gen era is Star Wars Battlefront. Uh, like and Star Wars Battlefront 2 for the original Xbox, PS2, etc. Uh, it would be really cool to get additional DLC maps based on maybe even some of the Disney era stuff with new characters and new stuff. That I think would be awesome. Stuff like that. Uh, there are actually entire communities dedicated to upgrading that game for exactly that purpose with like fan made DLC that that works if you have like a modded original Xbox and stuff. Um, so I like the core idea, but as you said, it depends. It really depends on the, the specific game. Um, do you have any examples you can think of? Well, I know of, well, some games that I know did add new features into the re-releases. I mean, the Sonic, the Sonic remasters that originally came out on the iPhone and Android, and that eventually became Sonic Origins, like, in... So, like, in Sonic 1, on the phone version of it, it added Tails and Knuckles, Tails could fly, you could set it so that you could have Super Sonic, uh, Spin Dash was there, Sonic 2, same same deal, you could actually control Tails' flight, it, it also added the Hidden Palace Zone that was cut from the original game, not the same map, but, like, the it added the zone in and, like, added a new map into it that you had to actually go out of your way to find. And then in the Sonic Origins version of all those games in Sonic CD, it also gave you the drop dash. And then in Sonic 3, 
well, yeah, it also gave you the drop dash and a bit more connective tissue for the storyline and restored some bosses, a boss in Sonic 3 and Knuckles that, for whatever reason, in the original release, when you combined it, Sonic 3 with Sonic and Knuckles, you got rid of the final boss of Sonic 3 if you weren't playing as Knuckles. It was very odd. Now, granted, Sonic Origins still has a bunch of other problems, but that's that that game, those games in particular are games where I feel like, yeah, adding stuff in, what, extra stuff into it, like the extra moves and making things more consistent was a pretty good move. So, see, I'm glad you brought that up, because that's a perfect example. Like, uh, I was thinking about this before, too, if there was anybody else who did that. Now, you just talked a bit about Sega, so I'm actually going to give Nintendo a shout here. They did this, too, um, in some cases for better, in some cases for worse. I don't know if you remember this, but um, when they were making the GBA, they were re-releasing a lot of Super Nintendo games, uh, but adding extra stuff to them. Like, there was uh, Super Mario World became, like, Super Mario Advance 3 or something like that. And it had, like, extra content in it. Um, they were doing that, I think it was one of the Donkey Kong countries they did that with. I think there was, like, a bunch where they were making upgraded versions just like that. I liked that, even though it mm-hmm. was kind of limited because it was on the GBA. Um, then there was examples that I thought were kind of stupid, which was, like, uh, do you remember on the Wii U they had um, NES Remix? Yeah, I I own that on either the 3DS or the Wii U, but I never actually got around to playing it. So what bummed me out about that was that I this was you have to remember everybody listening. This was before the NES Classic existed, and as insane as that seems now, Nintendo wasn't too big on re-releasing a lot of the NES stuff. They didn't really seem to care much about their own library. Uh, so when we got the NES pack or the NES remix, whatever it was, um, it seemed like what was going to happen was you would have the original NES versions of the games, and then you would also have like these newer upgraded or alternate versions that had specific features, but it wasn't really like that. It was, it was basically like completely almost like ROM hacks of those games to just have specific like timed missions and stuff that those games didn't play like originally. So that was more like that wasn't DLC. That was essentially like a spin-off almost is how it felt. So I, I didn't like that version of things so much, but I kind of like the way you said it just with the, with the Sonic origins collection it is the prime example of doing something really well like that. I don't know if uh, you saw or have the, the Sega Genesis mini two. Did you see that? I saw your video on it. I don't, have it and i actually like saw it and was like oh cool i want that oh it's going for a hundred bucks now no <laughs> well a hundred bucks is the retail really yeah oh. so if, if you're um, finding it for a hundred that's what it costs <laughs> okay it, it looks like it was a third party seller so i thought it was through amazon yeah yeah that amazon link is weird because it, it's not third party but it's it's going from sega japan who's shipping it it just looks weird but that is okay. real well, that's a real thing um, okay, so, and anyway, that's a right, separate. Well, that that actually might change things then. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> that, I wasn't I wasn't trying to convince you to get it. I was just explaining it. Um, but anyway, that the point is okay. So I'm glad you saw the video because in the video, and I, I point this out, uh, not only did Sega include you know a bunch of games, they also finished up a bunch of stuff that had never been released in the first place which I thought that was really cool. And then they made, like, upgrades to certain games, most notably, like, Space Harrier 2. Um, You could debate Sonic CD was sort of upgraded in the sense that it now had both versions, but I don't think that was the Sonic Origins build. Um, Well, yeah, no. I mean, that would have just still been the Sega CD build. It's just that they gave you the option of both soundtracks. Right. And so it it makes me wonder if, I mean... I, I. this this discussion has kind of opened the door a little bit. Like, how cool would it be to get, like, a Sega Genesis Mini 3 that is nothing but upgraded versions of a lot of their games? Like, Sonic Origins set being a subset of them, but then you just go into a bunch of them and add extra content and extra levels. And, like, that becomes the direction of mini consoles. Because I'm going to put it out there. I don't think they're ever going to do like a Master System Mini or a Saturn Mini or a mm. Dreamcast Mini. Um, well, which yeah. is a, sa- a Saturn or a Dreamcast Mini, like tech-wise right now, are just not feasible for... Well, it, Saturn might be feasible, just not at a competitive enough price point to make it worth it. Right. Mini consoles can absolutely not 
emulate the Dreamcast at this point. Yeah, not financially speaking. They'd have to do like little PC repros, which nobody would be happy with. The price point would suck. Mm -hmm. Saturn's also complicated because you lost a lot of the source code to those games. Right. Um, So there's just a lot of issues there, along with market viability. Master System you could totally do, but it probably has no market viability outside of Europe. In Europe it does. Um, That would actually be an interesting release. If they decide to do a Master System Mini exclusively in Europe through like special reserve games which is like a european version of limited run games that would be an interesting sale um i mean they did that astrocade thing or whatever it was the the astro port city arcade thing um which by the way i just came back from japan those you could still find on store shelves that clearly did not sell well oh, wow yeah so uh i i think that I, I don't know this i just think that the lesson that sega learned was Genesis, as always, is the only one they can ever sell, but they didn't want to just put it out on store shelves again because I I think they already got the bite of the apple they expected, that wide release logic. So they did it in this like limited release form just to make it worth it. And I, I think they did a very good job, but I, I, I think the only way you get another iteration of this is if they do something truly unique with it, like what we're talking about here. Uh, maybe add some 32x support just for the token nature of it, but yeah, I like uh, I don't I still don't really know like why Sega did the mini too. I mean, yeah, there's some Sega CD games on there, but like like you said, it's like the, the general audience for mini consoles is gone at this point. A- well, anyone who would have bought it bought the mini one. Right, and I I can only throw out there a guess on that. It's purely speculative. I think that, I mean, Sega is a company that's kind of, I don't know, in a way like in a between a rock and a hard place. Everybody wants them for their nostalgia, but they can only milk that for so long. You have to make new things that people get nostalgic about later, hence Sonic movies and whatever. Um, but, like, they know that there is always some money in going back to the well. But how do you present that they don't as much as i love sega they don't have the same nostalgia power that nintendo does nintendo could put out a classic edition of literally every game console they've ever made save for probably the virtual boy and the wii u and it would do well sega can only do the genesis it's the only one they can ever do and because again as we discussed that's only here in america they can't really well maybe and maybe europe like no they could do it in europe yeah I mean, the gen like remember, like the Genesis did not do well in Japan. Correct, and people forget that the the Mega Drive was a pretty significant flop over there. Um, which is uh, this is a history lesson, but that's why the Saturn became so different because Sega Japan found it embarrassing that their console didn't work in their own country. That's why Saturn was so radically different. Uh, but that's a different discussion. Um, anyway, the, the point where I'm going with all this is that it. I think that. Uh, they probably sat down and said, we'd love to do another mini, but like, what direction do we realistically take with it? Because if you want to do something like a Master System mini, which is very viable technologically speaking, um, or a Saturn mini, which might work in a very limited capacity, or a Dreamcast mini is just not technologically capable yet. But I'm sure they sat there and they thought, if we were to do a limited run, essentially, of the Genesis, how well would it perform? And thus, I think they that's why they made the Genesis 2 the way they did. They're like, okay, look, we already have this pre-existing design, so we can just, you know, go with that. We can, you know, put a whole bunch of different games in it. We can make some unique experiences in it. We can throw a Sega CD in just to truly make it something special and different. And we won't throw 32X in in case we need to save that idea for later. But selling it as, like, the limited way they did you have to wonder if they were thinking this is a way to test the grounds if you can basically make a limited run of one of these mini consoles and still make money off of it because if if this does well enough then maybe they're like okay you know what maybe we can do a master system mini and just focus on europe and anybody in the states that wants to import one they can but we're going to focus on europe or maybe even this because the saturn is the same problem like the saturn could only be marketably viable in japan and to enthusiasts over here right like well yeah like with the saturn you could with a saturn mini you could probably get like collectors like me and you if they put like the games that go for a ridiculous amount of money on it which i mean it, it 
for go for a ridiculous amount of money for Saturn that don't have licenses and issues. Like put like say you release a Saturn Mini with the Panzer Dragon Saga and Radiant Silver Gun, you'll probably get anyone who knows anything about the Saturn to pick that up if they don't already have both of those games. Precisely, but I, I'm I'm guessing that that was their market concern. They might want to try doing something like that, but I would assume someone told them, or they were just fearful of the idea that, like, look, man, Saturn anything doesn't do well. Let's see if we can make a small, limited version of a Genesis, our most popular console, and if that doesn't work, then Saturn definitely won't. Right. But if the Genesis does work, hey, maybe Saturn has a shot. And I, I this is all speculation, guys. This just makes sense to me. That's what I yeah. think probably happened, but I don't know. Um, it's not. I mean, they sent me one, but they didn't exactly tell me, you know, why that was the case. So uh, that's just a guess. But uh, I, it makes me think that there's some hope for them to continue that. I like. See, I, I I feel I'm so mixed on this because like the whole mini console thing. Like I both like it and dislike it because I don't really like little emulator boxes. But at the same time, in the Sega's unique case, I kind of like that they're actually revisiting hardware to an extent and they're actually making like interesting ones um, right. although i'll give nintendo props the fact that they finished up star fox 2 and put that on the snes classic was very cool um but the nes classic to me was really not very interesting the the turbo graphics slash pc engine one the fact that that even got made was kind of amusing but it didn't really <laughs> like, yeah did you know it, did, it didn't do well i, I mean, mean I have no idea. I've I've never seen the American one. I have seen the Japanese one a few times on that trip. They were still sitting there on store shelves. Um, the Genesis one. If, if, it, it, if it's still sitting on store shelves in Japan and it's not because they're like making a ton of them because they they sold out like crazy, which at this point would be dumb. It probably didn't do well because it, PC Engine did a ton was was basically. The well, I don't think it was the winner. I think that was still the SNES in Japan, but it beat the Mega Drive. Yeah, definitely... handedly, handedly. Yeah. Um, it, the the way that we look at the Turbo Graphics 16 in North America is the way the Japanese look at the Mega Drive. Like, oh right, that did exist. I forgot about that. Um, like it was technically there, and it technically had a great library, but nobody paid attention to it. Um, it, it is funny how different that actually is. And yet the Japanese constantly have to market the Genesis slash Mega Drive, even though their own people barely care about it. It's kind of this right. <laughs> weird internal conflict Sega has. Anyway, so, yeah, th we're getting a little off the rails. But the point was, reissuing these games with new content, I... I like it in concept, but as you said very eloquently at the very beginning of this, it really depends on the circumstances. And, you know, I think if I if I sit here and I think about, like, which games would I truly like to see that with, I, I don't know, man. Like, you know, I mean, I threw out Star Wars Battlefront, I think, would be, like, my number one, you know, random choice out there. I don't think that'll ever happen. Um... I could see Sega doing this. I can kind of see Nintendo maybe doing a little bit of this. Sega already yeah. kind of has done a lot I of mean, this. I mean, like fair. you said, Nintendo did it on the GBA with the Super Mario Advance Yeah, but that games. was like... Did, did depression, that was, did depression time? That was like 20 years ago. I know. But like, that messed but, up? But, but yeah, but when they did Super Mario Brothers 3, which was Super Mario Advance 4 for some reason because they... They did them out of order. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they had the whole e-reader thing with, like, you scan those cards, you <laughs> oh, get yeah. levels in there. And then the Wii U re-release of that just was like, well, okay, we don't have a way to do e-reader on this, so we'll just give you all those levels just when you when you buy it on the Wii U eShop. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Which you can't do anymore, so sorry to anyone who didn't realize that and has a Wii U and still didn't get that game. Oh, really? <laughs> There are there are ways, uh, not necessarily legitimate, but well, anyway. hey, yes, but I mean, <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, no, no, it's. I, I, do you want to throw out like a what's your like fantasy example? If you could just pull pluck one game from history and add new levels to it, jeez. I know uh, you could take a second and think about it because we're sitting here talking about this as more of like an industry standard as opposed to like specific titles we would actually want. I think that we're on the same page that we agree in concept. This is nice. Um, 
I don't see this being a sudden thing that changes. The only company I see quasi pursuing this is Sega for all the previously explained reasons. I think Nintendo doesn't really care now. I, th I mean, you have to understand, guys, the NES Classic and the SNES Classic came from desperation because the Wii U was a flop and they needed product, but they needed product that wasn't the Wii U. SNES um, Classic, right. maybe not so much. I think the Switch was out by then. It was, but I mean that thing was already well in development by that True. point, and that, that was. That and you got to remember yeah. the era in which it came out. The Switch wasn't. Nobody knew if that was going to work or not. The SNES, I think, was them hedging their bets. Hence, there has right. never. Yeah. They have never made an attempt at a Game Boy Classic, which would be fairly simple. Uh, nor have they made any sort of attempt at the N sixty four Classic, or certainly anything beyond that. Which I think all of us agree, the N sixty four classic would do very well. Does anybody yeah. question that? Like that that console would sell crazy, and they don't do it because they don't have to. That's where yeah, that was born. Like even from. like even though like the N sixty four didn't do as well as like the PlayStation here, um, the Not people who close, had yeah. the people who had the N sixty four really loved the N sixty four, and mm -hmm. also at the time like Nintendo was basically the only. Well, okay, no, Sega was still around, so they might have been trying to appeal to kids, too. But Nintendo was, like, the only one who was, like, still, like, mostly focusing on kids at the time. So people who love the N64 and have the nostalgia for the N64 really have the nostalgia for the N64. You know what's funny? In Japan, the N64 is basically, like, the in that generation, it's basically like the Saturn. It's the one that's sitting that nobody remembers ever really having. Like, it came wow. in third. It, yeah, I know, right? The the N64 lost out to the Saturn pretty handedly in Japan. Uh, so it's funny when you look at the, the generation we think of it as, like, the big three, per se. PlayStation kind of dominated every region, but then it swapped between the other two. Everybody had Saturn. Not too many yeah. people had N64 over there. Comparatively. Yeah. Like, say, like, I have a solid for the PS1 because I was, like, a preteen slash teenager. Well... No, I was, I, uh, yeah, I was like preteen to teenager during that time. So I was still a kid, but I was older, and they were definitely act. They were definitely targeting teen teenagers who hadn't been playing games at this point. Mm -hmm. which you know what worked out well for them. Yeah, uh, the N sixty four classic. If they did ever do that, though, I would hope that they put sin and punishment on it. Oh Are God. You you're familiar with that game, right? I've I've heard of it. I've seen it. I haven't actually gotten around the play. Uh, so it, but yes, it's it so <laughs> Sin and Punishment is an N64 game that was exclusive to Japan that I think was made by Treasure, if I remember correctly. Um, Treasure made like uh, Ikaruga. They made uh, they made a ton of games, but this game only came out in Japan. And uh, when they did the Wii, actually, they did a remake of it for the Wii. But people forget that there was actually a digital N64 version sold on the eShop back there, the Wii Shop or whatever the hell it was called, mm -hmm. um, that where they had actually taken the time to translate the whole thing. So the game was done. Like, it's it's in English. I were, I'm pretty sure if they were to ever do an N64 classic, they would put that on there as, like, the bonus game to appeal to North America. To yeah. be like, you never got to play this, and here it is, finally, all this all these years later. That would make a lot of sense to me. Um, but you know who, who who could actually really do a good job at this if they really wanted to? Sony. Keyword I is mean, if they really wanted it, to. I know. <laughs> we, we, we live in the Jim Ryan era. They're not doing it while he's there. We, we saw the we saw the PlayStation Classic. We know how they how they do this. But they have this ridiculously rich library of content they never touch with an incredibly nostalgic and large base imagine just if you will that they did like some sort of best of ps1 collection that was like your twisted metals and your metal gear solids like all these things like that everybody associates with the ps1 and then added a whole bunch of like new levels and content to everything and either they could put that in like the form of a classic or they could put it as like a physical disc release on ps5 it doesn't really matter or they sell it digitally whatever that their method is that they want to do but I feel like that would be crazy successful. And yeah, well, assuming that people were like, okay, we'll, we'll try this one thing, even though your PlayStation Classic was a complete piece of crap. Well, that's what I mean. They'd have to market it the right way. And if that's that's the difference. Like, if they did that as a 
PS5 like disc release and just called it like the best of PS1 or something, that's a different thing you're marketing as opposed to a, a like a brand new PS1. Oh, Maybe yeah. it, if it was you know like what I'm PS5, saying? it's different. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. All I'm trying to say is going back to the original question, Sony could absolutely kill it doing that if they wanted to but as you said they'd have to want to and i under jim ryan they're they're not they don't yeah like i i mean i haven't looked at the new ps plus since it came out and saw what was available like they have a couple of playstation one games on there um like if you have if you have the playstation game pass version of playstation plus um you could play wild arms and resident evil director's cut on your ps5 but I mean, I don't know how many... I, I think there's a few other classic PlayStation 1 games and PS2 games on there, too, but not a lot. Unless if it got expanded since that first came out, and I looked at it and it's like, eh, I'm not going to buy, buy this. I, I mean, I, I still have my Game Pass subscription, but I don't honestly use it enough as is, so it's like I don't need to buy the other one to play games I already have, basically. Yeah. No, I mean, it makes perfect sense. I mean... Uh, we're not going to really go down this road, but like we all know that Jim Ryan is very bad at this, and he does not value the nostalgia element of anything. And that's whatever; he's the one in charge. He gets to make that decision. But right. I'm, I, I seriously think that that is a huge missed opportunity, and I I hope that Sega capitalizes on it and continues with what they're doing. But I hope they do more like disc based editions of what they're doing and not just just reserving these things for these mini consoles it would be nice to have them in some sort of uh modern platform aside from their own but you know i don't know it's sega is famous for reissuing stuff so the fact that they like finished up seven games specifically for the mega drive mini or genesis mini 2 tells me that they'll probably put those out in some other form at some point at some point yeah but you know the thing with those though is they're all just kind of like bonus content i don't think there's anybody who's like oh man i gotta buy this for this upgraded version of space harrier 2 you know what i mean like i I just don't think that's why anybody jumped on it that's the other thing that i think is interesting about that release is that it's it's like anything that would actually sell the console it's right just, <laughs> thank you <interesting> exactly <laughs> it's it's all interesting for genesis fans and sega like diehard fans specifically but that is also why i said in the video i didn't think that one was really intended for a wide release because like sonic is not on the box you know what i mean like it's not it's like there is a sonic game on it there is a mediocre version of sonic 3d blast like the saturn version is the better version and it's it's just there because you had to have Sonic uh, on it. You don't agree? I, I will. Act, act, I will. I mean, well, I mean, the Saturn version is enhanced and stuff, but there's still like a there. There's definitely a lot more load times on it, and the Fair. Genesis version is the actual original version of the game. Uh, the Saturn version only came out because Sonic Extreme got canceled. Well, I know that, but yeah, like. like Oh shit! We need a Sonic game. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> we, we, we'll we'll defend Sonic 3D Blast on Genesis all day long. Fine, we'll we'll hook up with it for all I care. But point is, um, they barely have any Sonic content on there. Obviously, Sonic 3 was not on there. Um, what I find strange because I was double checking this, so they have Streets of Rage 3 on this machine, and they have Streets of Rage 2 on the first one. Streets of Rage 1 isn't on either of them. That's weird. Isn't it? I was so sure that Streets of Rage 1 was on the first one, but I, I like, double-checked. I looked at the box and listed all the games. It's not listed there. And I was like, really? And that didn't somehow make it to the, 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 the third? No, the second one? Okay. Whatever. Uh, I, I, I guess the... Log- well, I would say I guess the logic there would be, like, we, we only need one Streets of Rage game on this thing, but the Mini... The Mini 2 is, like, literally just marketed to, like, Genesis fans, so I, I'm pretty sure any Genesis fan, even ones who didn't actually play Streets of Rage all that much as a kid, like me, would definitely not mind having two or even all three Streets of Rage games on one mini console. Right. So, um, <laughs> I don't know, but either way, I still like that thing. I think that thing's really, really cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I hope that they continue with that trend of kind of upgrading some stuff. I would like to see them approach that 
with more of those games. You take that Sonic Origins approach uh, where you upgrade certain titles and see what else you can produce out of it. Though the problem that Sega always has with stuff like that is that most of their stuff is not that marketably viable on its own. Like Sonic is, but like outside of that, it's only diehard Sega fans that remember Rystar, for example. Right. Um, and it's like, how do you push that? I mean, this is that. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and even then, like with Rystar, I didn't know about Rystar until the GameCube era when it was on like Sonic Mega Collection or something like that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> Exactly. And people forget, he was intended to replace Sonic as Sega's mascot. Like, that's how much they got behind him. Uh, and it just did not happen, nope. even though it's a good game. Um, but whatever, I, I think, I, f- I feel like we've said enough on this. You got anything else? Uh, yeah, there's just one thing I would, well, I guess technically two things. One, if Sega does go to Sonic Origins route and adds more stuff to other classic games, make sure it's actually, like, fully functional before you release the damn thing. And two, I would also I definitely want them to have an option to not have to play without any of the extra content content to just like actually have the original game playable as well. That's fair. Yeah, I, I could understand that. Like just in the options menu, like original edition or upgraded edition yeah. or whatever. Yeah, that's fair. Um, okay, cool. Well, thank you to Chuck uh, slash I guess Abdullah for that. Um, so we'll move on. Uh, now we're going to do a round of shout outs. The following people are all Patreon backers that are at the tier in which they get a shout out. So huge shout outs to Luis Bonilla, Loke, Michael Kelly, Tim Inman, and Trey Wagner. Once again, that is Luis Bonilla, Loke, Michael Kelly, Tim Inman, and Trey Wagner. Thank you so much for your support. And anybody listening, if you ever want to sign up, the link is in the description. Thank you very much. Um, so the next subject, which was actually picked by you, Joseph, but because we also have other backers who get to pick subjects. We have Spencer per year and we have uh, Samuel Coxus, uh, neither of which got back to me <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> I even talked, I even talked to Samuel Coxus and I was like, yo dude, uh, he's like, hang on, I'll get back to it. And he just never did. So we got to move it's, on. It's the, it's December. It is. It, it's okay. So this subject, which is kind of two subjects, will just be on behalf of all three of you. So, do you want to take this away, or do you want me to just straight up read what you wrote? Uh, read what I wrote, because I don't remember exactly what I said. I remember, obviously, what the topic is, but... Okay, you got it. So, there's basically, this is broken into two parts. I'll just read both parts. Uh, the first part of this is, with Elden Ring, Sonic Frontiers, P- Pokemon, Scarlet, and Violet all existing and being open-world entries in a series that hasn't been open-world previously, are we in a new age of everyone rushing to make everything an open-world again? Or do we think these three are just the last stragglers into that trend? That's part one. Part two, what game franchise is the game franchise that isn't already an open world game that you'd be excited and interested to hear that a new installment is uh, is in is going to be uh, an open world game as well? Right, okay. Okay. Yeah. So do you want to start that or do you just want to hear my response? How do you want to handle it? You are the captain. I, yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll start with part one, and then we'll move into part two later. Go for um, it. So I am actually have a bit of mixed thoughts on this, because I've been kind of flipping and flopping between my thought process on this, like, the entire, since, like, last month when I first came up with the subject, but I deferred, deferred it because, you know, at the time I'd only played a little bit of Pokemon, but, like, part of me feels like that with... Pokemon and FromSoft like a going open world that it would be like oh yep everyone's definitely going to be wanting to go open world now that these two did it because they made a ton- a they made a ton of money but at the same time with Sonic doing the same thing at the same time it also kind of makes me feel like Sonic definitely has a tendency to straggle onto like certain trends that happen like after they've already been done like you remember with Sonic Lost World how everyone was like oh, look, it's the Sonic the Hedgehog Galaxy and stuff like that. <laughs> so, hey, uh, Sonic and the Black Knight or whatever. He's finally got an RPG or whatever that game mm-hmm. was. Sonic Chronicles was the RPG. Well, what's DS. Sonic and the Black Knight? Um, that's Sonic, that's uh, Auto Runner Sonic game with a sword. Okay, sure. Which is why, and it, the basically having the sword doesn't really fit with the gameplay at all, which is... Why, whenever I'm asked, I always say Black Knight is worse than Secret Rings. Or like Shadow the Hedgehog with a gun. <laughs> well, I mean, 
At least, I like at that least game they had the sense to have it be Shadow with the gun and not Sonic. Yeah, it's true. It, it's like in that game, Sonic even flat out was like, "Yeah, I wouldn't be caught dead using a gun." <laughs> but okay. <laughs> but anyway, let's actually stick on the topic that we're on because fine <laughs> for now. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, like I'm a little bit like like I said, like Sonic. Like say I'm not like I said I liked Sonic Frontiers. Sonic Frontiers was good. I loved Elden Ring. My main problem with Elden Ring was that the open world was a little bit too big and there was just too much stuff to do. I eventually just had to stop playing for a bit, twice. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then with Pokemon, I mean, the open world part of Pokemon is great. Like the actual game is great, but the performance issues kind of made it that I haven't actually finished it yet. But. That's a completely different topic, like... So, like, on one hand, I could definitely see other... Comp series being like, hmm, let's try this open world thing. So basically... I'm actually trying to think of what other stuff series that exists that could shift to open world, like... If, well, that's that's the second part of the question. Yeah. Do you want to stick to the first, or you already... Yeah, let, let's, stick with, let's stick with the first for now. The okay. second part is the ones that we would like to see go open world. Sure. Right now, I'm because I I just realized I was about to say Halo, except I think Halo Infinite actually did the open world thing. Mm-hmm. So, um, S- like, well, do you want my take on this? Yeah. Or, okay. So, uh, first of all, okay. So, open world's obviously been around for over twenty years now. I, it's it's not exactly a fad. It's it's basically it is just part of the industry. It's an established. It's like arguing if RPGs are a fad. You know, they've been around for a yeah, long no, time. No. They're just established. So an open world is more of a, a, uh, a construct that allows you to tell a narrative or tell a game or have a game exist in it. It's not so much a genre unto itself, I guess. But um, it's basically just a method by which you can make your game exist. So... Uh, I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon as it has no real reason to. It's kind of a great way for um, uh, different sorts of narratives and adventures to happen. And also people, I, I would argue that it's it's not tired, but it no longer has the kind of oomph that it once had. I mean, uh, we have to, I, I, I'm sorry to everybody when we talk about open world and I always have to bring this up, but you know, Shenmue was the first open world game and it, it blew everybody away on that the idea that of all the things you could do, but of course they got bigger with scale. And, and, you know, I remember when the first time I played like GTA three, the idea that you could just go anywhere on this map and it was, it barely ever had to load was just kind of stunning. You know, it's kind of like, uh, when we had graphical improvements from say jumping from like the NES to the SNES or the SNES to the N64 N64 to maybe the GameCube or whatever. I'm sticking with Nintendo on that analogy, but you, you were always kind of mind blown. But then when you reach a certain point, you're no longer impressed by that. It's just kind of like, oh yeah, I guess it's a little better. Um, that's kind of the same logic I see with uh, open world games. Like the idea of an open world as a concept is no longer impressive to us. They've existed for over two decades. What can only be impressive to us now is the sheer amount of detail in those maps. Um, and I would argue that it's it's a little bit more impressive when you have less load times. Um, yeah, it's it's. I don't know. I don't think you necessarily consider something like Far Cry to technically be an open world. I think more people would argue that it's more of a sandbox if we really want to split hairs on the idea. But one thing that is truly impressive about it is how genuinely massive those maps are, and the fact that it almost never has to load anything. Uh, which is a you know obviously an upgrade in the technology allowing that to be possible as well. Uh, so you know I, I don't think this that concept is is going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, but the the argument of stragglers, I think it's interesting that we never really had a Sonic or Pokemon game and that it's kind of hard to include Elden Ring since that's like something completely different but um, but those two franchises in, in general, the fact that they hadn't tried this yet is, I guess, a little surprising. Um, uh, but it's not super surprising in the case of Pokemon. I mean, on one hand, yeah, the people have been asking for it for basically 20 years. Um, but Game Freak is pretty solid on the whole formula thing. So it's... 
what I was going to say is I remember like 10 years ago when Skyrim came out and everybody was like, make this with Pokemon characters. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's why I'm a little surprised because as you just, it's been a thing for at least 10 years where people have been asking about that. Sonic, I guess I'm not surprised so much as I'm like, really, you never even tried. Like, because Sonic has done everything weird that was possible since you know yuji naka was no longer there yeah uh as we just talked about he did rpgs he did like weird you know all these other he's had racing games despite the fact that he runs faster than the car he's driving in you know Uh, he's you know what i mean (laughs) so he's multiple he had multiple ones of those like there's all star right i've sonic drift on the yep yep there's sonic drift one and two there's sonic r which technically he's running in that one. Uh, there's Sonic and Sega All Stars Racing, Sonic and All Stars Racing Transformed, which is horrible names but great games. Um, yeah, but but point is, like you know, he's kind of done a little bit of everything. Uh, and if you, I, I hate to say this, but when you follow Sonic, typically pay attention to what worked for Mario a few years earlier, and then you'll see Sonic do it eventually. Um, Mm -hmm. like, you know, let's be honest, the Sonic racing games were kind of born of the success of Mario Kart. Oh yeah. uh, Stuff like that. Let's just, I mean, let's just be honest about it. Um, so even though it might, uh, granted with the Sonic racing games, like, yeah, it was born because of the success of Mario Kart, but that's also kind of just a duh thing to do with Sonic. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. I agree. Um, but, uh, you know, like, Sonic got his RPG well after, you know, Mario got his and Super Mario RPG. I, I'm just I'm just saying. It's it's fine. So, uh, would, would you say Sonic Frontiers feels more like Breath of the Wild or Super Mario Odyssey? Odyssey. I mean... It, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> game, game, Gameplay-wise, it's Odyssey. Tone-wise, it's Breath of the Wild. Which is... Okay, so... so they, <laughs> So Sega just did what they they sometimes do. They just looked at Nintendo's big hit and then went, "All right, let's put Sonic in that." <laughs> and they just fused the two. That no yeah. part of me is surprised by that. So um, yeah. I mean, I know that they. I read somewhere that they tried to like do a more traditional open world with Sonic with Sonic Frontiers originally instead of like the segmented zones thing, open mm-hmm. zones thing. And for whatever reason, they decided it didn't work and then did how they did this way instead. I don't know if that was like a loading time. It was a technical thing. It didn't work, or just like, just like conceptually didn't work. But don't know, man. But uh, but yeah. So to to answer this point of the thing, I think that it the the genre is not going anywhere, and I wouldn't necessarily argue that they were stragglers. Just more like I'm slightly surprised they never tried it before, but I'm also not that surprised they finally did do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it, it I was always. There. I, I don't expect open world games to go away. I was just wondering if we were going to start seeing an influx of a bunch of already established stuff trying to go open world. Well, that's the next question. Isn't yeah. It? Well, okay, that, so, that's the stuff we want. But, right. Hmm. Okay. So, well. Okay. Or, fine. or at the very least, would think would be interesting to see. All right. Well, do you want to go into that now? Yeah. So, go for it. I'm uh, like there are a couple of th- games that I've been thinking of. In, in regards to this, like, I've actually flipped flop between the question of F for part two being which ones would we like to go open world and which ones would we absolutely hate to see go open world. Sure. But when I thought about it a bit more, it's like the ones that I partially thought would be like, no, this, there's no way an open world version of this would work. Part of me is still in, would still be intrigued to see them try. I'm kind of wondering, like, how, like, say, a Resident Evil or a, a Silent Hill game that was, like, actually, like, open world yeah. would work. <laughs> can can we explain the difference there? So Silent Hill or Resident Evil feels like open world because theoretically you can go to any part of the map, but it's not really. It's essentially, like, a pre-produced, like, puzzle, and you kind of have to go in very specific areas. Otherwise, nothing really changes. You're just kind of spinning your wheels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's so it's it it has the illusion of open world but doesn't really possess it it's yeah yeah. like the original resident evil you could argue is at least was non-linear because you have multiple ways you can initially sure about it but a lot of the later games it's pretty much a set progression it just oh god yeah no especially something like resident evil five or six (laughs) oh well those those are those are more those are those are action games that yeah, yeah. that are using the Resident Evil license. They're not. 
I, agree I, 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 I I'm not like a gatekeeper for what an actual real Resident Evil game is in that case because I actually like well when I played five when it first came out I liked it enough for what it was and I actually enjoyed six but we've already been part of this conversation where part of the appeal of Resident Evil to me was the nonsense bonkers storyline and lore sure stuff, less than the actual survival horror parts fair fair but. <laughs> A true open world Silent Hill game would be something cool. Yeah, like I mean, I don't know how well it would do, but you know, uh, I like the idea of it. Yeah, I would definitely be interested to see it, and would be tentatively excited um, for how that would be. Granted, like I said, tentatively because it is a Silent Hill, and most of the Silent Hill games after three apparently were not good. So. I never actually got around to playing any of them after three. So, did you? All right. So I, I'm gonna. I was gonna kind of maybe talk about some more like vanilla franchises that already exist, but I, I kind of want to talk about something a little bigger. I when when you first pitched this and I first read it, the the first thing that came to my mind, and it was probably because I've been thinking about the Wii U a lot lately. Do you remember one of the big appeals of the Wii U at first uh, was that? Uh, Sega and Nintendo announced kind of together that they were going to have like exclusive Sonic and Mario like experiences on the console. Does this ring a bell at all? No, I do remember Lost World had Yoshi's Island and Zelda DLC, which I assume was part of that, but I don't remember. It was. So basically they had... It was marketing. They were basically just saying, like, oh, Sonic's going to have exclusive games on the Wii U. That's all they were really saying. But the way they kind of pitched it, because of, you know, all the, the Olympics games that Mario and Sonic were finally in games together. Oh, right, those. They were, in, <laughs> they were in Smash together and all that sort of stuff. It is stunning to me that it is almost 2023, and there is no true Sonic Mario game. Uh, I know. The idea of, like, um, so... Did you ever play uh, Mortal Kombat versus DC Universe? Yes, I did. Okay, so imagine a story just as absurd as that game that has to draw like the Sonic and Mario universes together in some sort of gigantic open world adventure that can be played from like either perspective, from the Sega side or the Nintendo side. I want it. Give me. <laughs> right, right. Is it? I mean, just that elevator I, I, pitch I, I, alone. I don't even care if it's good. It's just that, yeah. that's just that's just little kid me going. I want it. Give me, give me. Yeah, give I me, know. Give me, give but, me, give me. Give me. <laughs> but the thing is, like, how cool? Like, I don't. I, again, we're we're spitballing here, guys. We're not game developers, but like the idea of doing something that bonkers where like these two universes collide for whatever reason and there's some sort of open world adventure and you're playing as i mean you could pick a team if you want to put it that way are you a sega kid are you a nintendo kid and it could be like you have to play as you know the nintendo kid like in the sega universe and vice versa and i mean the the honestly dude the the limit there's like almost no limitation on this imagination that you could have there yeah as long as both companies of course were cooperative i mean it would no surprise it would be a game exclusive to whatever nintendo hardware existed of course. I like, yeah there's no way nintendo would allow it to be on anything else but um i think that would be really cool and if it was successful you could kind of look at it like the way that nintendo took on smash bros where they started gradually involving other companies and bringing their ips in you know imagine you know pac-man is suddenly allowed to be there or uh you know solid snake or you know shovel knight or or whoever um kind of like (laughs) i mean it could be bonkers but the thing is it, it depends on how you do it because you could essentially make like ready player one you know that story slash movie you kind of almost take that logic of like every character exists together but you put it into a video game in a film i don't think that works very well but in a video game exclusively with video game characters almost like a wreck it ralph right? right uh almost like that that has i think serious potential to be interesting and i think that you, the time is there it's now to basically do something like that was specifically focused on the sega and nintendo universe because you have our whole generation is still playing video games we're the ones that grew up on all this we remember all this it would be a game made specifically for that now 
you'd have to sit down and like decide what the gameplay logistics are. You'd have to figure out between Sega and Nintendo who's actually the one developing it. Like all that, all that stuff. But in my, that's my fantasy open world game is something involving those two universes colliding, like DC uh, versus Mortal Kombat, which was the dumbest story ever. Okay. But that's all it needed. It didn't need I mean, to be good. Granted, that was that was it's, fine. Granted. It, 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 you say it's the dumbest story ever, ever, but it's the Mortal Kombat story. So yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, but yeah, well, whatever. if it wasn't a dumb story, it wouldn't have. Worked. It wouldn't be Mortal Kombat, right? But I mean, okay, so it's kind of like uh, I don't know if you played Ubisoft's like Mario Rabbids series. I played basi- the first one. It basically starts the same way with like this ridiculous premise that just shoves the rabbits into the Mario universe. Like it's mm-hmm. it's a video game. It's totally socially acceptable to just have some really stupid excuse like like at like on one side of the like okay, so there's imagine there's a Sega universe and there's a Nintendo universe and just by sheer coincidence at the same time Dr. Robotnik's working on this ultimate teleporter machine, Bowser is working on this like ultimate, you know, uh Finding the Mario, ultimate magic teleport. Ultimate finding, exactly. They're both working on it, and it, they both activate it at the same time, and that energy just, you know, forces them into the same universe together, uh, which, you know, I mean, how, I mean, you just saw this in your head when I said it. You know yes. you did. And yeah. it's because it's all you would need. And then I can't help but when I visualize what the actual, like, gameplay looks like i've probably been playing too much far cry because i'm sitting there imagining this like open field with mountains in the distance on one side water on the other animal life and like this giant sky and i just kind of imagine that but like you can see this like energy portal rift like throughout the skyline where it's like where nintendo and sega meet up one side of the sky is blue one side the sky is red you know like you know the the flowers that grow have are like little NESs or something. Just like it's like just all the subtleties that you could have out of this, and like the crafting and all the weird possibilities that could occur from just being like both companies being on board with like mine our history, do whatever you want, make something totally insane. You know, like every time you're on the Sega side and you go in the water, Echo the Dolphin is just swimming around in there. <laughs> you know, just yeah. stuff like that where it's just and on the, you know, at nighttime on the Nintendo side, all the stars look like, you know, Nintendo stars, there's a Mario stars. And on the Sonic side or Sega side, they always look like golden coins or rings. You know what I mean? Like right. it would just or, you know, I see some weird idea where you could take a Mario coin and a Sonic ring and you, like, craft them into something insane. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's yes. so <laughs> much there, you know? Uh, or even you could make jokes about stuff. Like, if you had to take, like, some piece of hardware. I don't know what kind of, you know, weapons or whatever we're thinking here. Again, I'm probably playing too much Far Cry because I'm sitting here thinking about crafting guns in this game, which makes no sense. Yeah. But, like, if you were to say, like, you craft some sort of, like, blaster cannon, let's call it that. Uh, and then, like, you're like, oh, I want to upgrade it. You can just grab a 32X and just shove it on there. And, like, <laughs> you, you can see, like, see all the potential that is yeah, there oh, yes. like, for all the in-jokes and, like, what this could be. And you can pick, like, I think you just pick either side. And either side comes with pluses and minuses. You know, Mario would be better at maybe crafting. And, you know, he could have shortcuts. And Sonic would be better at running. But you could also unlock other characters. And I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But you know I, I you want this like game to see, now. like, yeah, definitely see, like, some parts where you, like, have the Sega character in, the, like, the Nintendo world and, like, just do something that, like, seems completely, that, like, to anyone in there, from there would just seem, like, completely nonsensical and just, like, end up, like, completely somewhere else. But And then vice versa, like, say, if Mario and Green Hill Zone just, like, completely goes a completely different way than how anyone else would do it and everyone is just like, What? Right, he just thinks around. He thinks around the problem. It's kind of like so. I could see Mario and Sonic Kill Zone be obvious. They're like, all right, dude, you got to get all the way to the end. He's like, why? <laughs> like, <laughs> he's like, okay, fine. So he just like puts up a pipe and then just goes down and comes up at the end. And they're like, what the hell did you just do? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's. I think that that would be my fantasy open world crazy game that has never existed. Right. And probably yes. never will. That, in every conceivable way, beats the idea of Sonic and Mario at the Olympics. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, I don't... I mean, like... I never got the appeal of those Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, even for people who 
want Sonic and Mario in a game together. It's just like, why are they competing in the, why are they competing in the Olympics? Mario doesn't take place on Earth. What the hell? <laughs> it's like, a Sonic, really. Sonic explicitly does take place on a world called Earth, but really, yeah. Okay. It, 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 it's obviously not ours because, like, Station Square I was gonna say, stuff doesn't exist. But <laughs> well, I mean, again, it depends on the continuity. Like, one of the cartoons isn't the planet like called Morbius or something? Oh Morbius? yeah, in, in old cartoons and in the old and in the Genesis era, they called the planet Morbius until Sonic Adventure happened and say ah, it's right. like, yeah, it's on Earth. Okay, fine. Why not? Except it when it's not. <laughs> it doesn't exactly. It doesn't even matter. Like it doesn't matter. This is that's not the point. It's you can yeah. wipe all the canon, just make it a bunch of references to stuff. It's it, it would work. Um, I just think that that would be my like fantasy world. But I, I even though we're calling it Sonic and Mario something or other, um, you'd have to not limit it to just those characters. Oh, like God, yeah. you'd have to have like the ability, like uh, you know. Nintendo characters would have to be in there. Now I say Nintendo characters, like Metroid stuff would be in there. You know, Zelda stuff would be in there. Like every every little bit of whatever is in there. Same with the Sega stuff. The Sega stuff I think would be a little more interesting because they have like a ridiculously big catalog of characters that I think a lot of people don't know about. Yeah, Sega um, has a wide library of stuff that hasn't that th- that people don't necessarily remember all that much. Whereas Nintendo yep. has a I mean, it has a pretty decent li- sized library of IP at this point, but for most part, everyone basically remembers everything from Nintendo. At least their bigger ones, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, even their smaller ones do the Smash, but yeah. That's but. true. <laughs> yep. Uh, so that would be my answer. You got one? Mm. It's kind of hard to top that, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it, it is very hard to top that, especially for... I was going to say, like, maybe, like, Final Fantasy, except I just remembered Final Fantasy XV exists, and I think that one's technically open world. So, I just never actually got around to playing that one, so that doesn't work. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, like, like I said, like, the Silent Hill one would be amazing if it actually worked, but yeah, that would have worked. I'd still be interested to see it, or Resident Evil, and see them actually try it but all right i i got an idea for you so we'll just do the same idea but silent hill meets resident evil universe <laughs> <laughs> let's just do that uh okay uh anything else you any other suggestions anything else you want to say about this no i think i'm pretty pretty good on this all Which... right man <laughs> Well, thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for the subject. Uh, also, shout outs again to Samuel Coxus and Spencer Purrier. And we are now back. We've got Keith joining us. What's up, Keith? Welcome back. Hey, hey, how's it going, everybody? Nice to be back. And we got a little uh, Star Wars for you today. Huh? We we do we do we'll get to that in a minute but uh, it's funny actually in between the time in which uh, I recorded my segment with Joseph and I recorded with you uh, Samuel Coxus uh, one of the Patreon backers actually got back to me and gave me a subject so I oh. guess you, you you and I are gonna do it because earlier we kept saying he never got back to me because he hadn't and now he did <laughs> he oh. made it right he just buzzard shot that like right before the deadline but okay so uh, this is what he wanted us to talk about i'm just gonna read this exactly verbatim okay oh yeah go for it would you guys talk about good or bad gym experiences and how does it affect kids physical development um i should warn everybody cox is a little weird he's he's in my discord uh we would describe him as strange um (laughs) so (laughs) i don't i don't know why this subject would have been pitched to us. I mean, do you even work out? Wow. Um, not anymore. Not since, like, after high school, because I used to have to work out for, like, high school sports and stuff like that. So, you know, I don't anymore, other than, like, I go bowling. <laughs> right. I am, a, at the time we're recording but, this, yeah. I'm, like, three days away from turning 36, and if you look at me, you can tell I've not worked out since high school Yep. Uh, as well. So I have neither good nor bad gym experiences unless you include gym class. Yep. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I. But- I must say, I gotta, I gotta say this one thing though. I, I surprisingly actually do have a lot to say about this because I work at a high school, and at oh. this high school, I have to go to PE class with high school students. And one of the PE classes I had to go to all of last year in third period was weightlifting class, and I think that's like close enough to like the gym environment and the idea, especially for this subject. I so I actually got I, I actually got a lot to say about like, I guess when it comes to kids kids and what about kids right, right? Let me let me reframe it because yeah. it, it, upon re you know I'm looking at the the way he actually wrote the second part of the sentence I might have mis mis said this he said he's how does it uh, affect kids uh, or how does gaming affect kids physical development Oh gaming um, so but he did ask about gyms. I'm not really sure why. Okay. I think he was just trying to break the matrix here, but I guess the argument he's going with is, is let's look at this positively from the gamers perspective. Yeah. Can we argue that, uh, playing video games is bad for your physical health or good for it or what? Let's kind of shift it into that so that it actually sounds like something that makes any sense on this podcast. Yeah, that would work for the subject matter. Yeah, it make, completely makes sense, rather than getting off a topic about child development. You know? Yeah, so uh, you sound like you are much more knowledgeable about physical yeah. activity, which makes yeah. sense. You're mm-hmm. not me. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I will take the standpoint of why gaming is good for physical development. Yep. And if you agree with the notion, you could make the arguments or the case against why it's bad for physical development. Is that... Can we just kind of not saying we necessarily disagree or agree with each other? We'll just take. I'll take the pro side. Yeah, you can yeah, take yeah. The con side. Oh How no, no, no. perfect. I'm ready to go with that. Yeah, you go one side. I'll go the other. Yeah. I, All right. I got some points. Let's do it. Okay. All right. I I will exclusively stick to the pros of how gaming helps physical development. Um, it's a short list. I'm going to be completely honest. I, I, gaming is typically, you know, not good for your physical development. <laughs> I would argue it's good for your mental development. Uh, which is, of course, mind over body, you know, type of thing. If you, I would argue video games give you a lot of puzzle solving intelligence because they force uh, that sort of thing through your mind. They force you to solve that kind of activity, which gives you greater sense of strategy, which is more useful as a, a practice in life. I would argue I learned a lot more playing video games about real world puzzle solving skills because life is a series of problems that you have to solve than I did from, say, an actual math class. Um, now, obviously, I'm not claiming I learned mathematics better in video games, but just what is useful uh, in getting to the end of a, a puzzle, per se. Uh, and life, as I said, is basically a series of situations one must deal with. Uh, that's why school is all about teaching you, you know, uh, how to deal with essentially homework and things because they're basically conditioning you for the job space and all that stuff in the future. And I would argue that video games are a very creative way to expand the mind. And if you have a healthy mind, you have a better shot at a healthy body. But to be honest, that's kind of the end of end of the positives. Yeah. I definitely agree. With, unless I agree, I agree unless with it's a few like of those. the the only counter argument to that would be something like if you really got into actual physical exercise games like Wii Fit or or like all the Connect stuff like stuff that actually makes you move that's yep. a different subject entirely. Mm-hmm. That is basically fitness training programs just done in the leisure of your home rather than an actual gym. But I will never sit here and argue that video games in general do that, as that's a very small minority of game options. Yeah, agreed. Um, Well, when it comes to uh, a couple particular options, I have tried Ring Fit Adventure. And I'll tell you for one thing, as an actual exercise program, it's not fantastic because it's way too easy to um basically not do it um the the downside of exercise gaming is there's always a way to not exercise and still do the game if you know what i mean oh yeah Um, just like Wii bowling where you could just kind of flick your wrist and it was good enough oh no you can go all the way back man to the nes and track and field and nobody was standing up whenever i played track and field everybody was on their stomachs with their hands just slapping it with their you know hands as far as i remember so even yeah. that even that one was uh, built back in the day to get kids up and moving was still ki- the kids always figure out a way not to exercise is one thing I found out and even gamers in general but you know gaming can 
get you in a sedimentary lifestyle. It can get you really, really used to just kind of sitting there and getting rewarded for sitting there. I mean, not physically doing anything. You get all the, uh, you know, serotonin or whatnot in your brain without any physical, you know, worry or pain, I guess is the way to put it. And that's that's def- very detrimental to your uh, your muscle growth and definitely your health in general because just sitting there is definitely not good. So I'll definitely take that point. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can't argue it. Yeah, <laughs> like it's yeah. it's uh, okay. kind of objectively from, true. From, from my own experience, um, I work with a lot of kids that are technically gamers because that's all majority of what they do with their time, and seeing them uh, in a PE class as well at the same time, you could definitely see that uh, though their hand eye coordination is there, the ability to uh, uh, see. Um, uh, basically use their body memory, uh, full body memory kind of gets drawn down. You know, when you, when you do an activity or something, you rely a lot on body memory. And, uh, from what I've seen, I think gaming actually kind of brings that down a little bit like full body memory, not hand eye coordination. I mean, it's, yeah, it's two no, different I'm, things. Uh, you could actually argue hand eye coordination is actually improved by games because you're yes. forced to sync up with stuff, but how that extends to the overall body is not, great maybe to your fingers but you know that's about it yeah as a bowler i'll tell you that i'll tell you this much i could uh, i'm not very good at wee bowling but uh, i can do actual bowling very well <laughs> you know it's good, man. They, that's sometimes, good sometimes they don't just translate very well it, it, <laughs> it's a weird subject I, I, do you have anything I, else on it or are we just done? um <laughs> all i gotta say is this um for me in particular personally i guess this subject has to go person to person because I game and actually still do a lot of physical activity like bowling and stuff. Because after I game and while I game, I actually kind of get energized. And after I game, I usually can't do anything after but do stuff physically. So personally, gaming actually helps me from getting a more sedimentary lifestyle. Because gaming is more active to me than movie watching. I do watch a lot of movies and that can actually make me more sedimentary. Gaming kind of gets me up and moving gets my brain started and then i move off of that so in my case in particular gaming helps me move more if i didn't game oh. i'd probably sit down and watch movies way too much all right well i think we kind of switched sides on the subject but who cares yeah, I, thank I, you I, I, I thanks so cox I appreciate out. it <laughs> we're, we're, we're done all right let's move on to the next one thank speaking you. of like sitting on a couch and watching stuff yes watching wanna... stuff. that's what i want yes. to talk about all right, all right let's do I that i want to talk about sitting down and watching stuff and i spent a lot of time Sitting down and watching stuff in order to catch up and make sure that I got this time frame in order to watch the series on time. And uh, the series was Andor, which is a Star Wars spin-off series set before Rogue One. Uh, so it's a prequel to a prequel movie. It's, I want to si- say that prequel it's prequel series set, to a movie. Yeah, it is. I want to say it's set like five years after Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, because, good, the, good way to put it. Yeah. Which would have been like... Uh, 15 years prior to Rogue One. Yep. And we're going to spoil oh. the shit out of it because that's what we do. Uh, yeah, let's, we don't let's give just a shit say that, that now. Yeah, I want to make that clear to everybody listening. Like, this isn't just our thoughts on Andor in general. Like, this is open discussion. So, oh, yeah. if you care, uh, go watch it first. This is your warning about that because I know a lot of people have not seen it yet. Only because they either don't know it exists, they assume it will be bad, or they just don't care. Mm-hmm. So... This is your final warning. The big Star Wars alarms are signing. That oh, is going. Nice. Okay. All right. Moving on. All right. Go for it, man. Oh, that's a, first off, that's a wonderful alarm sound. I was very, very excited by that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So, Andor. We got the prequel to, a prequel to a prequel movie. Andor was introduced to us in Rogue One. One of the more interesting characters in that movie that kind of got my attention when I watched that movie for maybe five to ten minutes, except for the third act, which was kind of fun to watch. But Andor is, um, well, he's a, they, they portray him as a uh, orphan, street urchin, kind of Han Solo-ish type character, is the best way to put him. Han, he, he's your Han Solo-ish type guy. You know, it's funny, the second you said that, <laughs> yeah? I was thinking, like, somebody over there was like, look... The idea of a Han Solo movie wasn't the worst idea, but we <laughs> executed it so badly. Let's redo it with a different character and competently, and thus Andor was born. Yes, I will say I enjoyed the heck out of this series. Not really as, surprisingly enough, 
this is one series I forgot I was watching Star Wars while I was watching this. It yeah, I, I would you? totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah, it actually happened while I was watching this, and it was probably when he uh, a little bit after he um, went to prison uh, in this. After he went to uh, prison and stuff, and I started like for a second, I, t- I took a stand back because it went to a Mon Mothma scene, and she said something very obviously Star Wars, and I was like, "Oh shit, right." Oh shit! I'm watching. I'm Star watching Wars. fucking Star Wars. Yeah, shit, I thought I was watching a fucking Prison Break movie. Holy shit! I thought I was so, watching a really good Prison Break movie. All right. So, do you want to continue with like the recap of events? Do you want to talk about your overall thoughts? Just take yeah. take point. Yeah. Whatever you want. So, a lot of uh, great events happen with this. I want to go over some of the, the the main events that happen. It starts off as pretty much your stereotypical, very much spy thriller, uh, spy aspect to it. Lots of spy things going on here where we meet uh, characters who are in a resistance type, but only a version of the resistance. I noticed that there's like splinter cells of resistance here, that they don't really work together. There's not like some great grand army ready to go with Leia ready to kick some ass and stuff. There's, there's shit. There's a couple fucking spies, some senators, and uh, some crazy army dudes. That's all you got for the resistance right now. There's not much set up, from what I can tell. So that's kind of like the scene set at the area right now. There's not much going on, and uh, Andor is just living on the a random planet that I don't really know much about, which is uh, w- awakened every day by the great and uh, amazing Clancy Brown banging away at the hammers, which I really enjoyed. <laughs> did you, did you mm-hmm. notice that was Clancy Brown banging away those hammers? I love that. I did not. Oh yeah, that, that was a that was a famed Clancy Brown. Done a lot of great things, uh, voice acting and whatnot. Uh, great actor. I did notice Harry Potter's stepmother. <laughs> yes, Harry Potter's stepmother. I actually remember her from a, a lovely film called Three Men and a Little Lady, and she was. Oh, her. that's an OG reference. <laughs> oh yeah, in Three Men and a Little Lady, she plays the uh, the mistress of a uh, the headmistress of a private school for girls who's after Tom Selleck. Because everyone's wow. after Tom Selleck. <laughs> Did you know that Leonard Nimoy directed those? Or at least the first one? Well, God bless that, man, because I love the shit. You know, isn't that, that that's, it's all, I mean, that's not Star Wars or Star Trek, but it's still kind of funny That's oh, all kind of tied together. It's a beautiful anyway, thing. Yeah, 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 for those, that took me a while, by the way, when I was sitting there watching this, like, old lady talking, I was like, this woman looks so familiar, why? And then it hit me, I was like, Harry Potter's evil stepmother, wow, <laughs> Once okay. you hear her yell, I'm sure. Once you heard yeah. her yell, it kind of got it to you. So that's kind of the, setting the scene here beforehand. And, uh, you know, uh, Andor has a, his hands on some stolen Imperial tech he's got to sell, so he's trying to get his thing. He kind of just falls into everything, in all honesty. This is a lot of uh, uh, falling into things, and let's see what the fuck happens, and let's see how he gets out of it. Uh, yeah, you know what? All right, I, I'm glad you said that, yeah. because... I'm not going to lie. Like, I'm watching this thing. That's what's happening. When he went to prison, I actually thought this was all, like, a ploy. Like, he was trying to get into prison. Oh, like no. he, that was Like, that was intentional, and he was trying <laughs> to do something, like, liberate somebody. Like, this was all a mission, and that's what we were going to find out. It's like, yeah. no, he truly just screwed up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, that wasn't well, meant, he, that wasn't that intentional. That actually thing. was a surprise. What's really great is that, to me, I had a little trouble at the series at the beginning because it was hitting a lot of stereotypical points of a spy uh, kind of situation, uh, and also later on when he gets re- uh, recruited to uh, recruited to be a part of that crew to run the job to steal the, all that stuff, it felt very stereotypical of a like a heist movie crew. Like, oh, they don't trust him because he's the outsider. They don't know enough about him. There was a lot of that going. It was starting to kill me. It was starting to get me. But then then they started uh, talking about characters a bit more, working on the characters a bit more. And it, and it kept me in there a little bit. We switch from the, the heist movie. Uh, f- this is Andor's particular story. Uh, Andor's heist movie situation to actually what it's like to live in an authoritarian government. What's a, what, what, what would it be like to live in like Nazi Germany or something like that, honestly? Like if you were just walking down the street and you looked at a cop the wrong way. Because that's all that happened. And then we meet one of the best characters, Andy Serkis. Played by Andy Serkis. This great character. And talk about a, a um, not a totally unique prison, but a really, really um, well thought of, well written idea for a prison, I guess uh, is a good way to put it. Um, it shows. By the way, yeah. by the way, 
that makes Andy Serkis one of the few actors who's ever played more than one character in Star Wars. Yes. Assuming yep. you count the Disney trilogy, which I know sounds silly, yeah. but in my mental canon, it's not <laughs> it's not there, but it does exist, and we must acknowledge it as such. But if we do, we can also acknowledge B. Arthur as Star Wars Holiday Special. So that to me, it's just as just as relevant. Anyway, sorry, I just wanted to point that out. And so they actually have these guys working on um, manufacturing uh, pieces of what we find out later is pieces of the Death Star. Of course, got to put that in there, tie it all together. Yay, look, the Death Star. You know, I got to have that moment when I get to point at the screen, get, get my member berries on, you know, that type of thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love, I love mentioning the member berries, man. Because you are, you are a particular fan of member berries. I, I am I not, know. but. Come on, that, no, no, you love your I, member I, berries. That a boy. Come I, on. I do not. But <laughs> one thing I, actually, I, one thing I like about this is, I want to say this, this, of all the Disney Star Wars properties, this had the least amount of member berries in it. True. There was there was very few like, hey, remember that? Hey, remember that? Yep. It's like the only references to anything else actually makes sense. Like it would make sense that they run into Saw Gerrera because there's not much of a military facility for the rebels yet, but he was active. That's known in in the continuity. It makes sense that Mon Mothma would be behaving the way she was because she was actually doing that in the timeline. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, it's not like we're like, hey, look, there's young Luke. You know, like, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we it. don't have anything like that. There's. I, I was very worried about a Princess Leia cameo, but I thank God there was nothing. Yeah. I was worried. Anyway, sorry, go on, go on. Yeah, so we got Andor in the prison, and they run this prison, uh, the way they keep prisoners from almost rioting, as it were, is to kind of keep them competing against each other, uh, trying to do the fastest time, get get as much work done as possible. And they got them competing, and the prize is just, you know, uh, it's just a, a, a basically flavoring added to their food. Instead of bland food, you get some flavor. That, that's your reward. But the but honestly, I thought that was really smart, really interesting way to do a, a, a prison. You know, have the prisoners against each other in a game. It keeps them occupied while they're working, keeps them motivated to work. Yeah, very smart way to do it. Very empire way to do it is, is a good way to put it. Over rather than just recapping the events of the entire yeah, I can't, show, I like, can't go what, straight to straight, man. I can't. Yeah, like it's fine. I want to. Uh, yeah. Just tell me like what you overall thought of it. Like what was yeah. the vibe to you? So. The overall vibe was um, spy thriller mixed with um, a great prison uh, break movie set in the Star Wars world, starring Han Solo that we always should have had. I guess that's a good way to put it, right there. Mm -hmm. um, just just a, a story in the Star Wars world, self-contained yet connected properly, without member too many member berry connections, and. Well acted. Um, they got great actors with it, especially also a lot of the Imperial actors. I thought they did a hell of a job as well. So I really enjoyed the acting as well. A lot of great British talent. Yeah, I, there was some there was some cool recycled cast from various things. Where do you remember like the the little uh, Imperial guy? Who was um, he had like a Scottish accent? I think it was Scottish. Huh. Oh yeah. And he, oh yeah, yeah. I, oh no, he was the. I, I, the I was like, I was sitting there being like, why do I remember this guy? What is this dude from? And then I was like, oh, he was in Chernobyl. He was like <laughs> the lead of like one of the the Russian guys who had to go underground and like you know set up this whole facility, knowing his entire team would die. And I was like, this guy is good. I like this guy. Yeah. But it was it was cool to see a lot of these like British standard actors like recycled into this Star Wars property that made me pretty happy but let me let me talk about this thing overall so go for it um I, I don't know exactly what compelled them to make this what it kind of felt like was what we said before kind of jokingly was that they felt like they wanted to recycle the idea of han solo but not actually use the real character because they messed that up so significantly and they were like, well, Diego Luna is a very talented actor. It almost felt like they wanted to give Diego Luna a Star Wars show and forgot he had already played a character. Because oh, there yes, are... It's the old Taito Waitiki uh, Natalie Portman issue. Yeah, I get you. Kind of. So they just literally named the show after him. I mean, obviously that's not what actually happened, but that's how it feels because timeline-wise, he would be like 15 years younger than the events of Rogue One when he clearly is like five years older as far as when they filmed it. 
Uh, also, it contradicts one of his most notable lines in Rogue One, where he says he was in the fight since he was six years old, but the show itself proves that he was like a full-grown man when he had anything to do with that. Uh, so that doesn't make sense anymore. Those are like small things. I'm sure that they, you know, maybe by his own headcanon, oh, he was a six-year-old kid when he saw those aliens crash on his planet, and he just counts that as the beginning. That was a but notable whatever. turn, right. You're right. Yeah, but but that's hard to count because the Empire didn't even exist when that happened. But mm-hmm. whatever, whatever. That's, that's nitpicking stuff. Um, the thing about this show that's bizarre... Uh, and unfortunate is that it's one of the few times that Star Wars ever really deviated from the stereotype of Star Wars. And it, as a result, it's very good. It doesn't, you know, my problem with Star Wars now is that it's incredibly limited. Um, when, when they were making the original three films, they were just telling a story and they came up with cool things along the way that just helped tell that story. For example, um, if you're watching Empire, they wanted a scene where they were doing a snow planet fight, right? It's like, okay, so we need some sort of speeder crafts because these are, you know, it's alien futuristic type of technology. But what could the Empire have? Well, they need like their version of a tank. Well, I don't know. Wouldn't it be cool if they just kind of like walked? And then everybody decided, you know, that Imperial walkers are awesome. So now you have to have Imperial walkers and everything for it to be Star Wars. Uh, you have to have lightsabers you have to have jedis you have to have magic you have to have all these things that make it star wars for the mass audiences to be engaged with it and they very rarely have deviated from that since uh like the prequels kind of did and then kind of didn't but the disney era stuff has been nothing but hey remember the other movies remember all these other things we'll just do all that which has at some times been interesting, like Rogue One itself was amusing. But in general, it's it's just kind of eh. I mean, that's that was, I think, what we talked about with the Obi-Wan show, is that it was so spaced out, and they were basically taking... The entire show was predicated on remember these characters, even though they couldn't really advance or grow because of the finite limitations of the timeline. Andor is a unique one because it does not care about any of that at all. It It is the only thing since the original trilogy that legitimately feels like well maybe other than mandalorian at least season one of mandalorian that legitimately feels like hey this is the universe of the this you know this universe has so much going on we've only told you like small bits and pieces of like this war but here's some side stuff that's going on this shows us the grunt side of the empire that's just doing day-to-day minutia stuff it shows us exactly like their tactics and what those guys actually do whereas the movies would just show you the end of the line of that you know situation where oh we found them we don't explain how like for example an empire we don't actually follow exactly how you know boba thought to track uh by hiding around in the garbage and all that we just kind of get snippets of it but this whole show is like okay let's sit around have a board meeting to figure this out but that's that is so grounded in the reality of star wars that i actually found it really refreshing because it's kind of what star wars fans always kind of claim they want and yet we never get it we just we're like well wait a minute where's darth vader in this show why isn't he there so I, I feel like it was nice that we got this, but the show also flopped. It flopped hard. Now, I think it was victim of the fact that everyone is so burned out on Star Wars content because Disney has just oh, it blasted really... It. They really annihilated this franchise like in a ridiculous way. So it's like nobody even cares. Like And the idea of pitching a show about a character from a movie that they themselves made that nobody seemed to really care much for was a strange idea. It feels again like I was saying it feels like they just decided Diego Luna is a good, you know, character actor and they wanted him in the lead of this uh just to play a cool like rebel or Han Solo type and then we're like, "Oh right, I guess we have to make it Cassie and Andor because he technically played that character too." Um that's that's how it feels. At times, the show is incredibly slow. 
Like, I don't know if I've ever seen a show with a slower burn that I actually enjoyed, but that's the thing. I enjoyed it. Yep. Thoroughly. I would highly recommend this to a lot of people, but it's it's kind of hard to pitch because it's hard to even describe what my favorite element of it is because it's 12 episodes. If I were to pitch the overall plot of this show, it sounds like a 20-minute video because basically the show is like, there's this guy who uh, is, you know, in the outskirts of this this rebel empire like struggle. He doesn't want anything to do with it. He kind of gets drawn into it and realizes why they're a force of evil and decides I'm going to stand up to this. That's the entire series right there, in the sentence. <laughs> like, yeah. It, it, you know, it's it's not. It, it's very drawn out, yeah. and yet I loved it. Yes, but it's it's drawn out in a good way, I believe. And not only that, but it gave me, in particular, a reason to fight, if you know what I mean. Like, so many times, so long in Star Wars, it's like, why do we fight the Empire? They're the bad guys. So so that's that's why we fight the Empire? They're the bad guys. They they got the red red stuff. We fight the guys with the red stuff. But no, we, there's a reason. You rise up. There's a reason. You say no more. And I finally saw the reason why the galaxy was going to rise up against the Empire. And and that felt wonderful. I totally agree with you. The show did an amazing job of explaining, the again, the ground game of the Empire and why they're so hated. Because even in the original trilogy, if you watch, like, A New Hope just, like, by itself, like, the Empire really doesn't do anything all that bad in that film. I mean, yes, they destroy Alderaan, which is obviously terrible, but that was just Grand Moff Tarkin acting kind of on his own, uh, which, of course, was terrible. But, like, in general, they don't do a whole lot, but they have this reputation of being awful. Like, I guess they kill Aunt Owen and Uncle, you know, Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. But there's not a whole lot outside of that. You know, they they kind of are just cops walking around. Mm Mm-hmm. They, they don't come off as particularly intimidating. And then from there on out, they're kind of treated as, like, cannon fodder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, not, they're not treated as, like, they're just, we're just told they're the bad guys. We don't get to see it a whole lot. There are several examples. And obviously, I, I'm not trying to belittle the destruction of Alderaan. I realize if that were to actually happen in a civilized society, that would be, like, uh, very significant. But again, it was it was literally just Tarkin acting on his own. It wasn't like a, a direct, you know, request of the Empire formally. It's actually in hindsight you have to wonder how he had the authority to just unilaterally do that. But whatever, um, doesn't really matter. This show does show you that. It shows you what it would be like to live in like a totalitarian dictatorship, yep. and like how awful it is to express your own thoughts and to stand out and try to achieve anything and move forward. And it, it just it. It, it did a very good job of that. Um, I mean, there are very few other iterations of Star Wars that try. Most of it, sadly, actually comes in the Disney era because the George Lucas era barely even touched it. Yeah. Because after the original trilogy, they really didn't. Um, Clone Wars took place before it. So Rebels, Rebels was a kid's show. But Rebels had a few incidents of it, but they were all like comic supervillain like logic like i remember the pilot of that episode we were meant to hate the empire because this one fat imperial dude was eating a bunch of fruit in front of a bunch of starving people he's like well we're the empire we can do what we want nom, 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 nom. <laughs> i'm like that's as bad as they got yeah. <laughs> like, in that show like it's it's they weren't really that awful yeah um, you needed to see you got you needed to see like um uh alderaan in the correct context you need to see you needed to see alderaan as the holocaust and you never got to see it that way until a little bit this showed you the real yeah you know? i yeah I mean, it's is hard that what to you mean? is that what you're talking about yes yeah, okay, I, okay. I, it's hard to it's you know i it's we have to draw some historical parallels obviously unfortunately sorry i'm not trying i'm not trying to mention, no, 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 mention no, 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 these no, people fine, ever fine. i don't need to mention yeah no no I, i'm not it, that's not what we're talking about i'm just mm-hmm. saying like it's yes Pretty much. Like, you have to show... It's hard for Disney, of all companies, to portray the Empire as what they are, which is an allegory for the Third Reich. But you can't do that in with a kid's Di- show. Yeah, with Disney villains yeah. being, the, so, you know, the, the Disney villains are like the height of just, oh, right. I'm evil. They, exactly. So, in general, they always kind of shied away from it. Yeah, yeah. I kind of give them props in this show that they didn't. 
you know, they, they, they showed, I'm not going to say they went to the full extreme of what they could have, obviously, but they actually showed us like why it would be so awful to be around these people and to be under these people. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, that was one of the greatest things about this show. They showed this from the Imperial side and how awful it is to live in this chaotic universe full of like thieves and rebels and criminals and terrorists. Yeah. Very nice. And all they want to do is when they're trying to just bring order to stuff <laughs> from their perspective, the show does an unbelievable job of giving both sides a grounded reality case rather than empire bad rebels. Good. I mean, that's, that is actually one of the stupidest things about the Disney era movies is even after the war is over, supposedly suddenly it's back and bigger for no reason with no justification because the first order is a thing and we're the resistance i hate those movies we're not and sorry uh. i brought it up but like i hate that so much we're at like no just no yeah but that, um, uh, the whole time i was watching andor i was thinking to myself i was like how the hell did they try to justify all this new order shit when i need i need all this extra stuff i need all this extra empire stuff God yeah, damn it. Yeah. Sorry. Go. No, no, you're good. I'm glad we agree. Um, but yeah, that's honestly what I would tell anybody out there is Andor is not this. It's weird because I really liked this show. I really liked it as a Star Wars fan. I liked it as someone who likes interesting character dynamics. I like someone who I liked it as someone who likes, you know, compelling storytelling. But it is not a very engaging show. That's the weirdest part. Like I said, it's a very slow burn. It is not going to try and win you over by like, action, action, something big's happening. Oh my God, these are such big consequences. Oh, remember Darth Vader? He's in there now. So we, we they mix it up with like nostalgia and action and they don't try to make it dumb for you. They basically say, this is going to take time and you're going to learn everything about these characters. You're going to learn everything about this universe and it's going to take a long time for that to unfold. You're either on board or you're not. And the sad part is, even though everybody said this is the kind of thing they wanted, almost nobody was on board. Yep. Sad enough as it was. I had no interest at all to even check out the show, really. And after the first couple episodes, because of the slowness, I was having trouble. I did say, like I said earlier, uh, the first couple episodes were kind of just blah to me and it was it wasn't until i started listening to the characters and took taking the time that i started really getting into it and uh yeah you got to take that in mind when you see this that it's the slow burn that you've not seen before that all these great moments that i'm important pointing out and firing at you you know this and there between that is a lot of world building a lot of world and character building that is necessary for a proper story to be told. We're going to get told a proper Star Wars story. You're going to get told a proper Star Wars story here. Sit back, relax. It's like reading the books back in the day. Enjoy. Kind of, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It's yeah. kind of like reading a really long book. Yes. It, it's just, it's got so much detail in it that it's it's almost insane this even got made. Like how this got greenlit, I have no idea. I'm glad it did. And the I'm going to be honest with you, dude. I would never have checked it out if it weren't for the fact that, I mean, I was just clicking through like my news feed on YouTube and there was just a million like YouTube reviewers being like, the best Star Wars show, no one is watching. And like there's a million videos like that. And I was like, really? Like Andor? And I actually sat there and I'm like, fine, I'll give it a shot. Because it was, but it was great. It was great. I really liked it. I mean, so much so that I would argue that even though the Disney has done everything they can to put out the fire that was the candle of Star Wars in my heart, um, this kind of reignited it a bit. Like, I actually was like, you know what? I like this. I want to see more Star Wars. I just, I want them to try harder. This was trying harder. And it's not a perfect show. Don't get me wrong. Like, it it probably is too long. And as we said, there are certain elements of it where you go like, well, why did that even happen? Like with Andor, like I thought he was, when he went to prison, maybe he was like, oh, this is all part of a scheme. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to liberate, you know, um, Andy Circus, and he's going to help us do something. Like I was kind of, there was no point. It was, it was literally like a four episode arc just to be like, Hey, he, he messed up our bad. You know, like he got caught. This yeah. is another reason he doesn't like the empire. That's, that's all it teaches mm -hmm. you like in an overall, but I kind of liked it for that reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, I'll say this. I don't know if you saw it, but after this was over, Disney put out another star Wars show that like nobody is talking about. 
even less than Andor, probably because it's animated. Tales of the Jedi. Did you see that? I haven't even had a chance because of all this stuff. Okay. But I, I honestly don't think I would have checked it out. So here's the thing. Tales of the Jedi, you can watch. It's only six episodes. You can watch the entire thing in 90 minutes. Nice. Because the, the, every episode is only like 10 or 15 minutes. It's it's very short. They're, they're random times. They're not very long. Each one is basically like an animated short vignette of different things things in Jedi past that eventually justify certain actions. Mm. Basically, there's only six episodes. Three are about Ahsoka and three are about Count Dooku. The Ahsoka stuff I didn't really care as much about, but the Dooku stuff, that was really good. Ooh. Like, really good. Like, I wish they just got rid of the Ahsoka stuff and just did six episodes of, like, why did Dooku turn out the way he did? Because that's essentially the, the mini-series they made. I highly recommend, like, when you're off this call and you're ready to go do something go sit down and watch that oh, yeah. i think you'll enjoy the the count dooku stuff because i was like dude this guy's a much deeper character than attack of the clones ever could possibly have portrayed him as instead of just some guy you like see his entire background with qui-gon like w- what he thought of it when oh, qui-gon yeah. died like his entire fall like it's all there in like three episodes that are 10 minutes each it's Really good. Dude, I'm missing all this stuff, man. I'm not hearing about enough of it. Yeah, I... go go watch that when we're done. And that goes to oh, everybody yeah. else out there, too. Go go watch Tales from the Jedi. That one, like I said, is short. You can do that in 90 minutes. Yeah, but... probably, yeah get, get the, get, watch that. Get excited. And then when you have some actual time to unravel something, watch Andor. Agreed. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to say on Andor? Well, I... No, not really in particular, only that I'm really glad that you suggested this as a topic, only because I don't think I would have finished it or, or power through it as early. I would have taken me longer. So thank goodness, yeah, I, because I, like I said, the first few episodes didn't get me, and I got a little stuck in there because I got a little Star Wars <laughs> fatigue, like what's going on here? But then, bam, I just I stuck with it. I completely agree with yep. you. Like, when I, when I sat down to watch it, uh, you know, the only thing that kept me going. So like I sat down to watch it because I, so I've been, since I've been back from Japan, I have done nothing but film videos, edit videos, export videos in that sequence. Right. And so I got to a phase where I had to export a whole bunch of stuff and exporting takes time and there's nothing else I can do productive during it. So I was like, I'm going to just watch some and or, or something just to kind of kill some time. So I put it on the first episode and I was like, this is really dragging. Like, I don't know why I'm watching this other than that a bunch of YouTubers said I should. And I don't think I would have continued to the second episode if I had had anything else to do. But I didn't because I had to wait for all this footage to export. Mm-hmm. So I kept going. Yep. And then all of a sudden I realized this show is great. So that's my advice to everybody out there. The first episode, maybe even the second one, it just feels yep. like you don't know why you're watching this. But trust me. The slowest burn you can ever even imagine. That's what that show is. And it ends up being like, huh, that was totally worth it. That was a great show. <laughs> the ultimate wait for it show, guys. Yep. That's what this is. You're going to like it if you're a Star Wars fan. And honestly, I want to pitch this out to you, folks. If you are not a Star Wars fan, but you enjoy spy thrillers, prison breaks, things like that, check it out. If you've got the time, if you've got nothing to watch, and you like that type of stuff, they play alone. Andor will play alone, even without the Star Wars knowledge. Trust me, it's quite good. Even if you did not know Star Wars, you could really enjoy this. You know what? That's probably true. No, I swear. Which is actually, I was tracking that the is, whole time. Which is really weird, because that says a lot. Like mm-hmm. It's kind of like, so if you go back and watch anything in Star Wars, I would argue that A New Hope is the only film that can stand on its own. Uh, yeah. And that was because it, it was the only one for a little while that did stand on its own. Like, you walk into Empire, you'll have no idea what's going on without having seen it. Return like, of the Jedi, you'll be freaked out. Yeah, going, Return what the, the hell? The pre- that was actually one of the biggest flaws <laughs> of the prequels, is they, even though they took place before the OT, they were utterly dependent upon the OT for lore. Yep. Which is not a good idea. Because you're like, who are these guys? What's going on? Like, I, I had actually talked to, I remember being in high school and stuff when those movies came out. And there were a bunch of kids who had never seen the original trilogy, but they were watching the new movies because they were like, yeah. this is Star Wars. I guess I'm supposed to see this. They had no idea what any of this was. Uh, it made no sense to them. And that was one of the biggest, I mean, there's many flaws, but but the Disney trilogy makes the same mistake. Every single movie is kind of treated like you already know all this stuff. 
Yet, in Disney's case, it was even worse because they were, like, recycling stuff and destroying continuity while pretending it was new. It, oh, it's just awful. But um, this show is unique because it legit can absolutely function on its own, irregardless if you've ever seen anything Star Wars related. Now, obviously, you'll get more out of it if you have. Yep. There might be a few parts here and there where you're like, okay... Where that makes a little less sense, but I think in general, it's the simple basic concept the New Hope had, which is there is this evil empire, and there are people that resist it, and that was as I mean at its core, that's kind of like what both of them are, and this one does a very good job of establishing that and repeating that by being like, yeah, this is we're on the side against those guys, and this one shows so well why we should hate those guys. <laughs> So the Star Wars universe is massive, and we kind of talked about this before. Theoretically, you could set any sort of story in that universe. Like, if you argue that all of Earth's history is a universe, in that universe contains stories of westerns and wars and mm -hmm. adventures yep. and anything. That that Star Wars is the same thing. It's a it's a it's a series of history. It's just what specific events occurred. You can tell stories about. Star Wars has infinite, vast possibility for story. The problem is it doesn't have infinite, vast possibility for marketing. See, mm -hmm. that's the issue with Andor, is even though Star Wars was like the biggest IP oh, ever, yeah. it also, it's, the, it's completely predicated now on, well... Put Darth Vader on the box because people know him, so that's a guaranteed extra sale. Yeah, which means yeah, they need to have I'm, I'm Darth Vader in the show. I've not seen Andor lunchboxes and toys. Right? Yeah, I get you. I get you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's the cruel irony of it. Like the only reason it's popular is because of a few accidents that happened early on that we have to now recycle infinitely to keep people coming back, which is the exact thing they're complaining about. So they're like, "Give us stuff like Andor." Then they do, and nobody watches it. This is everybody blames Hollywood for having no creativity. They occasionally they do, guys. They throw something out like this, and none of you went to go see it. <laughs> that'll put that's a cap on it right there. Yep. Nicely anyway, yeah that that'll do it for yep. that. Thank you, uh, as always. Thank you, Keith, for joining. Of course. Uh, and I will give you credit for picking the subject, even though, as you said, I did. Yay. Um, and a uh, shout out to Cox for coming in at the last minute and giving us the weird subject about gym experiences. Yeah. Uh, also shout out to uh, Spencer per year, uh, as well as Joseph Tamburino for joining earlier. Abdullah, we hope you get well soon. Chuck, thank you for the subject. And of course, Luis Bonilla, Loke, Michael Kelly, Tim Inman, and Trey Wagner. Thank you to all of you guys, as always, as well as everybody listening. Thank you for listening. Uh, please subscribe, like, comment, all that fun stuff. Check out the social media stuff in the description, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, Patreon, etc. Appreciate the support. Check out the new flying and eating channel thank you very much and i'll see you all later